sorry. Your family. Yep. All right, our Father in heaven, thank you for your word that we get an opportunity to commune with you tonight, be in your presence through the reading of your word. Lord, I pray that we would uh, learn how compassionate you are through this chapter, how your love for people um, often is uncomprehensible to us. Many times we struggle with loving people, Lord, but you are slow to anger and you are merciful and gracious. And I pray that we leave here tonight being more like you, more gracious like you, more compassionate like you. And this is in your son Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. 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 So uh, welcome to Bible study tonight. Uh, For those of you who are new to our church, uh, my name is Eric. I am executive pastor here. Uh, My dad is the lead pastor. And of course, all of us, um, many of us already know that. But I just wanted to clear that for all those who are new and don't know exactly who I am. Um, On Sunday, I wore a shirt. This past Sunday, I wore a shirt. And uh, right when I walked through the door, um, the shirt said Burr on it, B-U-R-R. And it said Burr 1800. Um, and it was like, it's like one of those uh, vote for this person shirts. Um, but the shirt that I was wearing was um, in regards to Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr was the vice president in America in 1800s. But when I walked through the door, Jimmy and Erica both thought it was like a vote for Bernie shirt. Um, but it, it said Burr. And I think she was like, you know, typical millennial voting for uh, Bernie Sanders. That wasn't the case. This was way before socialism was a thing. This was uh, 18, 1800. We're now in 2020. So, man, like 220 years ago. But I wore that shirt um, because it's from, it's from Hamilton. It's from the play Hamilton. But nevertheless, fun fact about Aaron Burr um, is that he is the grandson of Jonathan Edwards. Wow, that sounds really good. Yeah. Sorry, it was was just like hanging, dangling off of my ear. He's a grandson of Jonathan Edwards. And some of us know who Jonathan Edwards is here. Hosanna, you know who he is. Um, Many of us here know who Jonathan Edwards is. He is one of the most influential pastors in American history. Before we were founded as a nation, before we became the United States of America, We were in colonial times. America was in the colonial stage. We were still kind of owned by the British. Uh, But there was Jonathan Edwards in the early 1700s. And he was uh, a Christian who was preaching um, in a small church. And he preached one message that was different than all of his messages that he had preached. And this is Jonathan Edwards. I don't know if you guys can see it. This is a small little picture of him. This is one of the books that I have that he writes. I have other books that he has. But this is Jonathan Edwards. He had a wig, one of those white wig guys. Um, But he preached a sermon in a small church. And it was different from any other sermon that he had preached. It was, you know, I was reading the sermon today. And a lot of us would have been really, really uncomfortable with the sermon that he preached. Not because it wasn't true. But because of how uh, it would have made you feel, oftentimes as a, as a church, we need to hear that, you know, we need to be um, understanding that we don't deserve grace. We don't deserve God's love. As sinners, we are separated from God. God is so holy and he's so um, just that uh, he looks upon sin and he hates it. And that was what his sermon was about. It was about hating sin, the God hating sin. And his most famous sermon was called uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God is a sermon you can look up later on if you want, later on tonight or later on this week. Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, all about our need for Jesus, but it was so much... He was like the first fire and brimstone preacher. But he didn't preach that way all the time. This was something out of the norm for him. But he believed it was necessary to preach that message to spark about revival within Christianity, particularly around the time of American colonialism before we became the United States of America. Now, this sermon was responsible for what's called the Great Awakening. Now, some of us have learned that in like elementary school. It's been a long time. 
the Great Awakening was this explosion of Christianity um, in the 14 colonies before America became a nation. It was this explosion of Christianity, Protestant Christianity, not Catholic, not Catholicism, but Protestant Reformed Christianity within America. It was the very beginning stages. It's probably a product of where, why, where we're at today as a Christian, um, as a lot of Christians within America or Christian influence. Without Jonathan Edwards preaching this sermon, we wouldn't have the Christian ideals we, we now have, especially within um, the Declaration of Independence, within the Constitution. But he preached it, and a lot of people's response after this was to fall on their face and cry out to God in repentance. And so there was great revival within that time, and a lot of people became Christians because of that. Similarly, when we look at Jonah chapter 3 tonight, we see a message that is preached, and hearts are now turned, um, a nation repents, and we'll see what that looks like. Turn with me to Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3 will be in verse 1. We're going to read the whole chapter tonight. Jonah is a really small book. We're almost done with it. Almost done with another book here at the church. We've, we teach through books of the Bible. And Jonah's <laughs> one of those ones that we're getting through done pretty quickly. We have one more week in it. Rob's going to teach us next week. Next week. But this is Jonah chapter 3. It's only 10 verses. Um, I'm going to read it, and then we'll go back to verse 1, and we'll break it down. Uh, so follow along with me in God's Word. I'll be reading out of the English Standard Version. So if you have a Bible app, and you have a different translation, uh, you can flip to the ESV if you'd like. It says this, this is the Word of God, verse 1 says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. Three days journey in breadth, Jonah began to go into the city going a day's journey and he called out, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast nor herd nor flock taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. So for the past couple weeks, we've been learning about Jonah's life. Um, and last week, vocab talked to us about, taught us about Jonah being in the belly of the fish. Um, God had rescued him from death, and now he spit off into the shore. Jonah was running away from God. God said, why don't you go to Nineveh, which is about like a 500-mile journey from Israel to Nineveh. And he says, you know, I'm going to go as far away from God as I possibly can because I do not want to go to these people. And then they, we had read uh, where Elder David taught us that he was thrown off the boat, and uh, the sailors believed in God because of this great um, catastrophe that was going on in the ocean, this chaos. But then they believed in God, um, and uh, the, the seas were calm, and then Jonah was swallowed by the great fish. And I'm sure uh, Vocab talked to us last week about the miracle of that and how sometimes that's not believed by many people. But I want to challenge those who think that um, the miracle in the story isn't necessarily about the great fish. Uh, The miracle in the story is about the repentance of a nation, how quickly they had turned. Let's start in verse 1. It says, When the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. So now, so he was once reluctant to go, and he still kind of is, but he didn't want to go. He was like, I'm going to go as far away from a God as possible. And here he is, and now why is he now, why is he now going, obeying God's command? 
um, really there isn't much of a choice for him. Uh, God called him to do it. He must do it. Um, in our lives, we're called to do things. God will call us to do things. And he's going to make it happen in our life, especially when there is a calling. Uh, I remember for me, when I was, when I was uh, 16, 17, we had went to a small church. Um, my dad was, I think he was, uh, he was just supporting a friend, or either he was rapping or supporting a friend, Jimmy R.C. Now, Jimmy R.C. is a good family friend of ours. He's, a, one of the, he's one of those preachers that is um, all over the place as far as the animation he has, really charismatic, yells a lot. It's not really my style of preaching. You won't really see me yell a lot here. But he's really, he yells a lot. He has a lot of passion. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but for me, I was kind of a newer believer. I had just kind of gotten saved. And, and um, I'm at this church, and I was kind of skeptical. I was, I was skeptical of uh, people who behave that way. I'm like, why do we have to be so angry as preaching? And there's nothing wrong with that. That's kind of his style. But for me, I was being skeptical. I'm like, why is he so angry with his preaching style? And so I was sitting in the back, skeptical, and he was starting to um, call people up and say something to them prophetically. Now, I'm skeptical when it comes to um, people speaking things over my life. So I'm like, oh, you better be true about this. And uh, how do I know that you're at? this is actually a word from God? And so this guy, he, uh, I was sitting in the back, he had called people, he had preached over my dad, said that my dad's going to be a pastor. Before my dad was a pastor, so he's going to be a pastor. And I'm like, I could see that, you know, my dad has kind of had that calling on his life in the past. He feels that calling, I could see that. And he, it was a small church, and I'm in the back, and then he, he eventually calls me, I'm the last one he calls, and I went up, I went up to the uh, front, and I was reluctant, didn't want to go up, because I was skeptical. So, but I was obedient, didn't want to just, I didn't want to be uh, embarrassing, I didn't want to embarrass him, I didn't want to embarrass myself, so I just listened to him, and I walked up reluctantly. And he said to me um, that I was going to write a lot of things for God, and that I was going to teach people about God. And I'm like, well, one, I don't want to be a teacher. Um, I'm not going to college to be a teacher. I actually want to go into sports marketing. I want to do business with sports. I'm not going to do that. So, so far, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about because he doesn't know me. And secondly, I hate writing. I don't like writing. I do it because I have to. I I don't like writing. Um, And then fast forward to now, um, almost... 28. And I'm in seminary now. I went through I went through Bible college. I've written well over hundreds of papers on uh, God and on Scripture. Um, so I didn't want to do that, though. It's not something that I wanted to do. I was reluctant to even hear this man and hear that God had spoken something to him to deliver it to me. But I responded in reluctance. Uh, my dad too responded in reluctance uh, in his journey to become a pastor. It was not something that he um, actually wanted to pursue, but it's something that he felt called to do. And so here it is with Jonah. Um, He is called to do something. He's reluctant to do it, runs away from it, but God gets a hold of him. And so it is sometimes in our life where God has something that he wants us to do, and he places that on our hearts until it's accomplished. And this is compassionate, this is merciful, this is gracious of God. When we don't want to do something, God is patient with us, and he works on us, and he actually changes us so that we actually obey him. But it takes patience, and this happens with God's people. You know that you're loved by God when he's patient with you and will fulfill the calling he has on your life. A little while ago, I... um, I was having a conversation with Rob, and I said, you know, I don't even know why I need to go to seminary anymore. It's a long drive. Sometimes I feel like it's pointless. And I went and preached in my seminary class. I had to preach to my, to my classmates. I had to give a message to my classmates. And I didn't want to give it, but I, I gave it. It just feels weird. You know, some of you guys have preached lab, you sometimes you feel weird, like having to um, share your thoughts of what you have on the text um, to your peers, to your family, your church family. Well, for me, it, it felt similar like that, but I had to preach in front of them and give them a 20-minute sermon to students that are just like me, same type of level of education, and also had to preach to even see, seasoned pastors, people who have been pastors for years in this. And then afterwards, uh, I felt encouraged because they said, you know, I, some of them, I shared this with Rob, they said, 
I want, and I didn't want to go. I felt like, why am I in seminary? And then when I came, after I preached, they told me, you know, I know that you're called to do this. I can tell that you're called to teach God's word. And that felt encouraging. God will often encourage us and support us in our ministry. Jonah here, he doesn't necessarily have a choice. God is making this happen in his life, and it's for Jonah's good. Keep going with me in verse 2. It says, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. Now, I want to point out this. The, the city is great as far as the size. There's about 120,000 people in the city. But not just that. Um, this city is important to God. Most commentators believe that this here, when it says this, that great city, it's to show God's in, that it's important to God, that this city has importance to God. But why would God find this city so important? These people are evil people. Um, if you're familiar with the um, Assyrians, Nineveh is part of being an Assyrian uh, country, an Assyrian providence. What they would do is, if, do you guys know what chain gangs are? Yeah. Chain gangs, you know, you chain them up to their feet. They have shackles on their feet and they'd um, travel that way. These people didn't do that. Uh, their chain gang was get a fish hook and uh, hook it into your lip and walk that way. So you were slaves when they captured you, when they conquered you, they hook a fish hook to your mouth. And then you would be captured and walk along that way. So not a chain gang with, ink, with, with chains on your ankles, but actually on your lip. These were wicked. These were evil people. They did a lot of evil things, but they're important to God. They are undeserving of compassion, undeserving of grace, but they're important to God. And Jonah does not like them. Uh, Jonah, in fact, is racist <laughs> against Nineveh. He does not like these particular people. It is not like this people group. They're oppressive. Um, they do damage to Israel. Um, and they treat people like garbage. Uh, also, one of the things that they would do is that uh, they would, if they conquered you, they'd skin you alive. Um, they'd like hang a flayed man banner up and uh, they would show you that this is how uh, strong we are as a nation. They're evil people. Flay skin you alive and show you how powerful they are. But this city is important to God. Um, now many of us would look at that and like, how could that city be important to God? How could a city so evil, a nation so evil, be important to God? Let's keep reading. Still in verse 2, and call out against it. No, Jonah is supposed to call out against it in the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three, day, three days' journey in breadth. And Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So this is the only message that we know of that is preached. He goes in about a day's journey, about a third of the way through the city of Nineveh, and he preaches this message very short. Now, it may be that Jonah doesn't like these people so much that he preaches such a short message and it kind of leaves it at that. That's a possibility. I would see that that may be consistent with Noah's dislike for these people and his reluctance still to go um, to this nation. Now, he, Jonah doesn't actually still even have a heart change. We'll see that in chapter 4 with Rob. Um, his heart isn't changed toward these people, but he's being obedient to God. God gave him the word and say, this nation, your nation is going to be destroyed in 40 days. And the people of Nineveh, what does it say? Believed God. They believed God. No, Jonah has a message. God is given. It seems impossible for this message to transform hearts. Um, Jonah actually believes that God can do it, and that's why he doesn't want to go to Nineveh. But for many of us, when we give a message, are we confident enough that God is going to change people's hearts? Maybe not even standing up here, but maybe you're talking to your family member, talking to a friend who's far out of reach from God, so far away from God, and we share a message of hope, share a message about Jesus, about their hope being hope in Jesus, and their hearts are changed. 
Are we going to trust God with what we have? Uh, my dad had spoken this past Sunday about uh, knowing, having, feeling like you don't have enough knowledge to be able to share your faith. Um, he said, share what you do know. And Jonah, we, Jonah's a prophet, so he knows a lot. But it was a short message for us. If you feel like you don't know a lot, share what you know. Do you know that uh, Jesus died on the cross? Do you know why? Of course, we know he died for sins. Do you know that if you believe in him, you'll have eternal life? Yeah. That's sufficient enough. You share the gospel with someone so simply. It's sufficient enough. And it's powerful enough to save because you aren't the one who's saving. It is God who's doing the saving. The reason why people believe in God is not because of we're so amazing speakers, but because God is so powerful enough and compassionate enough yes. to save. I made a mistake when I was uh, in ministry, and my wife and I were in this ministry to high school students, and uh, I made a mistake. There was an atheist kid. He was, uh, he was an atheist kid. He was like the most popular atheist kid at this high school. And I said, you know what? I'm going to commit myself to... Uh, winning him over, um, sharing Jesus with them, because I'm, I know how to talk to people about apologetics. I know how to defend the faith, so I'm going to um, use my ability to teach him God's word, and I'm going to persuade him. And so when we got to summer camp up in Northern California, he still wasn't believing in God. Um, and so what I did is I started having a debate with him. He said, you know, I, I, don't, I, can't, I don't believe God exists because the, the story of Genesis contradicts um, what science teaches us about the, the earth, um, the sun existing before the earth, and the Bible says that the earth existed before the sun, and so we started reading through Genesis, and we got into a debate. Um, but what I didn't do in that moment is have compassion on him and just share Christ with him. Um, I was more so focused on winning a debate so that he would believe in God, when actually he ju I just needed to be present with him, hear his concern, and just tell him about the hope that is in Jesus. That if he rejects these, uh, if he rejects the God of the Bible, uh, that there isn't hope for him. Um, that all there is is just hopelessness, meaninglessness in the world. And so I made that mistake. I could have just kept it short. So sometimes we can keep things short. But Jonah here, he gives a short message, and it's transformative. He says, and they believed God. Um, and, then, and then go into a verse... Continuing in verse 5, it says, They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from greatest of them to the least of them. So we're going to be learning now about repentance and what that looks like. Sackcloth. Um, I, I brought some sackcloth tonight so you can kind of have an idea. Um, this has a snowman on it or a polar bear on it. Disregard the polar bear. Um, but this is sackcloth. Sackcloth, if you put this on, it feels like, it's like burlap. Um, it feels very uncomfortable. So what these people had to do uh, to show that they were in repentance is that they put on the most uncomfortable thing you could wear and show how disgusted they were with sin. I'm going to feel uncomfortable because sin is uncomfortable and has offended God. So I'm going to go through this feeling of feeling uncomfortable for that. You know, we live in a culture today that tells us um, don't shame people. Okay, there's some wisdom in that. Um, but it also communicates this message of you should never feel shame. Um, and that's not true. Uh, there is well-placed shame. Well-placed shame is when we feel shame for doing something that is wrong, uh, particularly when we understand that we have sinned against God. That's well-placed shame. So don't let people tell you, don't feel shame. Sometimes we need to feel shame. You shouldn't feel shame when you've done something right. Don't feel shame there. But when you've done something wrong, a little bit of shame is good because it has us doing what the Ninevites did, which is running to God in repentance, putting on sackcloth, putting on this uncomfortability, sitting with it, realizing I have offended God. I need to run to him. I need to run because I need his compassion. So they put on sackcloth and it says from the greatest of them to the least of them. One of the... Um, signs of repentance. And there's six signs that I want to show you of repentance here in Nineveh. One of the signs of repentance is that they responded quickly. Repentance is done quickly. You hear about Jesus, you hear that you're a sinner, 
You need to respond quickly. Don't just think about, I, I, I can wait on it, let me live the rest of my life. Uh, let me do what's comfortable to me in my situation. Um, turn from it. Uh, God calls us to turn from it. Nineveh, most evil people ever, we're not, I'm sure some of us, as far as standards go, uh, didn't do what they did. We're not as evil as they are. Um, and God is so compassionate to them. How compassionate is he to us? So they, respect, they repent quickly. And it said, verse 6, The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. What repentance does, it, um, it mourns sin. Mourn. Um, what, me, what it means to mourn is to uh, be in sorrow, sadness over your sin. Um, when I was speaking to you guys about Jonathan Edwards a few moments ago, that's what people did in early America. Um, they mourned over their sin. They realized that they need a savior. Um, Jonah preaches a message saying destruction is going to come if you don't repent. The modern day presentation of that is if you don't believe in Jesus, destruction will come upon your life. And we don't want that. So we have to be like prophets as far as speaking the word of God, what God has said, telling people um, that they need to repent. And so repentance mourns sin. And also the king shows us an example. Repentance gets us off our throne. Many of us tend to feel like we are um, on a throne in our life. We're in control. We're reigning over our life. We need to um, do things our way and not God's way. But when you genuinely repent, you get off your throne. You put on sackcloth. You feel the shame of sin. And then you turn to God in repentance. So we, we as Christians, we always need to check ourselves. Are we on our throne? Or is God on the throne in our life? God is on the throne. Um, are we trying to knock him off? And we can't. But are we trying to knock him off and put ourselves on there? And that's often what we do with our sin. But the king of Nineveh, he gets off his throne and genuinely repents and puts on sackcloth and he sits in ashes. Verse 7 says, And he issued a proclamation and... and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. And let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that, in his, that is in his hands. Uh, Jonah, uh, he didn't preach this message to the king. Um, he preached this to the common people. And it was just this one message as far as we know. He preached this message of, if you don't, you know, if you don't turn, um, destruction is going to come. And it reached as far as it is all the way to the, the biggest person in charge. Uh, God's word is so powerful that all we need to do is just speak the word of God. Speaking the word of God does the work of God. Speaking the word of God does the work of God. It has the power to change humble people, the lowest of people in society. But not just that, it also has the power to change an entire nation in the person at the top of the nation. As we keep speaking the word of God, keep talking about Jesus, people in leadership will come to know Christ. And that may seem impossible, but here it is in Jonah. Social reform, many people talk about we need to have social reform, social change, uh, society needs to change. Um, but what we learn from Jonah is if we say God's word, if we proclaim God's word, social reform comes through that, through the proclamation of the word of God. How did the Great Awakening happen in America? Well, the word of God was spoken through someone. And people began to be saved. And so how does social reform happen? Well, obedient Christians proclaim the word of God. That's how social reform happens. And Jonah is evidence of that happening. 
And so we have this, and then it says that these animals are no longer supposed to eat. Now, I don't know why the king is starving the animals. It doesn't seem necessary for him to starve animals, but that's just to show you how wicked he felt about his nation, how evil he felt, how not just his people, but the animals must have offended God too. So he wants his people to cry out, but not just his people, also his animals. If you don't feed the animals, they're going to start crying out as well because they're hungry. He wants his people to cry. He declares a fast and wants his people to cry out, not just for food, but cry out to God. So when we fast, when it feels uncomfortable, when we want to grow closer to God, um, when we're yearning for food and our stomach is growling, I mean, we cry out to God. Nineveh cried out to God in their hunger. The animals cried out to God in their hunger. May we too also cry out to God, showing that we're repentant, showing that we need God's compassion. We need his mercy. And then it says, um, they, they say, a couple sentences in, it says, Let everyone turn from his evil ways and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Another thing that repentance does is it shows us those who are truly repentant, those who are authentically repented of their sins, they recognize that they are not deserving of compassion. They recognize they're not deserving of forgiveness. Here the king says, who knows, may God may turn and relent. He's showing that we don't deserve um, God's grace. We don't deserve to be spared from this destruction that's supposed to come upon us. We don't deserve that. Um, for many people who are out there, I see a lot, a lot of messages on social media. So many of them that say, you're worthy, uh, you're enough. Um, and that may be true in certain contexts, but when it comes in the grand scheme of life in, our, in regards to our relationship with God, we recognize that we uh, don't deserve things, uh, that we don't deserve to be forgiven. Many people tend to have a, uh, a misunderstanding about the cross that, yeah, Jesus died to forgive my sins and therefore I can just live however I want. Um, they don't even under, understand that they don't deserve forgiveness. Um, that God isn't um, demanding. God isn't as far as uh, he isn't, um, he does not have to, I guess I should say, he does not have to. It is not imperative for him to forgive anyone. But because God is slow to anger and merciful and gracious, he uh, gives people the opportunity to repent and then he even gives them the gift to repent. And so he does here in this passage, who knows, but the true repentance, um, you know that you don't deserve to be forgiven. In verse 10 it says, When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. I, I, sometimes people tend to think that, yeah, God changes his mind, and here's evidence of that. I think a better translation of the Hebrew text of the word relent it's not that God um, changed his mind, but more so that God had compassion. God had compassion. Um, God had compassion on them and, and, and did not do the disaster that he was going to, uh, that he said he would do on them. And if you know actually about Israel history, God actually ends up destroying them um, in the future because they um, repented for a little bit and uh, they went back to doing what their evil ways. So even though God, God uh, did not destroy them that day, he ends up um, destroying them in the future because um, their repentance was short-lived. But genuine repentance, as far as that goes for us, genuine repentance looks like um, an understanding that I need God's forgiveness, an understanding that you don't deserve God's forgiveness, an understanding that God is compassionate, an understanding that you don't need to be on the throne of your life that you need to understand that God is on the throne in that he wants to remove us off of our thrones, our little thrones in life and show you that he is sovereign over all things and he wants to extend compassion to you. 
And so tonight, in conclusion, I want to leave you with this. God can use the weak to accomplish mighty things by his compassion. So Jonah is weak. He is not a strong prophet. Um, and he's often, he's running away from God. But God can use those who are reluctant, those who are weak. If any of us here today are reluctant followers of Jesus, we don't want to do what Jesus wants to do. If God has put a call in our life and we feel reluctant to do it, God is more than able to have compassion on your life and do mighty things through you, not for your glory, but for his. And that doesn't always mean preaching up here by in a pulpit, preaching on a Bible study tonight. One of the great things I love about um, the reformers in, during the Protestant Reformation, during the 1500s, is that a lot of them said that a calling doesn't always have to be in regards to preaching. Many people think that it's preaching. A calling could be the occupation that God has given you in your life to be a servant to him and do mighty things that way. It doesn't always have to be pastor. It doesn't always have to be Bible teacher. What is God calling you to do to work mightily through your life? Another thing, he is compassion to those who repent. He is compassionate to those who repent. If you don't hear anything that I've spoken about tonight, I want you to hear two things. That God, this passage, this chapter is really teaching us about God's compassion. And he is compassion, he is compassion enough to change our hearts so that we will repent. He wants us to repent. Now what in your life, you don't need to share this tonight, unless you have a, an accountability partner or a brother or sister in Christ that you trust. What in your life do you feel like you need to repent of? What in your life do you feel like is in the way of your relationship with God? Do you feel reluctant to do the things that God wants you to do? Why do you? And are you willing to repent? Because God is compassionate. It says that um, Scripture tells us that God's arm in the book of Isaiah, that God's arm isn't too far enough where he can't reach us. God doesn't have T-Rex arms. He has long arms where he can reach the most farthest person out there who is so hostile to God. He has ability to reach us. What do you need to repent of? And who do you need to extend compassion to? What do you need to repent of and who do you need to ex extend compassion to? I want to uh, pray for you tonight and then we can uh, go home. But I really want you to sit home and, and I really want you to go home and think about God's compassion and your call to minister to people and also your call to repent when you need to repent. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for being so compassionate. Lord, we, are, uh, we aren't like Nineveh. We aren't as wicked as they are, Lord, but there are areas in our life that we need to repent of. I pray that we don't run away from you as Jonah did, but that we run to you and we respond in a way uh, where we feel the mourning of our sin, where you point out to us in our life, in our mind right now, where we need to honor you more. I pray that we would mourn that area, Lord, where we would hate it, where we would disgust, be disgusted of that part of our life. May we not like it because it displeases you, but may we run to you because you are compassionate, that you love us and you care for us. Lord, may we remember the cross that you loved us so much that you sent Christ to forgive us. That the cross is the ultimate display of your compassion on us who are undeserving. Lord, may we ex display compassion to others. May we be slow to be angry as you are. 
May we be quick to, to give grace where grace needs to be extended, but where, may we also speak the truth, speak the truth in love, Lord. Your word does the work. It is not us, but it is your word that saves. It is your word that does the power to change hearts. Many people, Lord, in our life, in our families, they tend to think that uh, they can't change. They think that uh, uh, they're so far away from God that it's not even worth it to hear about God. It's not even worth it to come to church. Um, Lord, but you are uh, slow to anger. You are compassionate and powerful enough to save the most farthest person out. And so we pray for whoever that is, Lord, whoever's on our heart tonight that seems to be so far away from you, we pray that you would save them. And Lord, thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. That was great, Eric. Thanks, Erica. I really needed that. Yeah. Thank you.